Hello and welcome to Maiden Mother Matriarch. My guest today is Professor Michael Bailey. You may know him as the author of the slightly infamous book, The Man Who Would Be Queen, which is published now about 20 years ago and has been controversial ever since. He is a sexologist, a specialist in sexual orientation, including autogynophilia, which is the subject of the most of the main part of our conversation. We also, at the very end, in the extended section available to some subscribers, talk about paedophilia and hebophilia and some of the ethical quandaries involved in studying these subjects and, and what we should do with men who experience those kind of sexual desires. It was quite a tough conversation and at times very explicit, um, but it's also completely fascinating and I really hope that um, some viewers and listeners who've never come across scientific discussions like this will will come across new information and will hopefully have their eyes open to what is quite a grim subject, but is also um, a very important one. So, Michael, some of my viewers and listeners will probably have already read the book that um, certainly brought you to my attention many years ago, The Man Who Would Be Queen. Could you start by explaining to us why it caused such a hullabaloo? Uh, the Man Who Would Be Queen was published in 2003. Uh, I wrote the book um, in the late 90s into you know, the 2000s. Uh, and I was motivated primarily because uh, of an important uh, truth that almost nobody knew about, including uh, alleged scholars uh, of um, gender identity and sexual orientation. Uh, and that idea, the primary motive why I wrote the book uh, the was to um, tell people about the idea of autogynephilia, mm -hmm. uh, which I addressed in only one third of the book. Uh, but autogynephilia uh, is uh, a man's uh, sexual arousal by the fantasy of being a woman or of having a woman's body. Obviously, uh, most men do not have autogynephilia, but a, a subset uh, does, a, a small subset. And, and uh, autogynephilia is one of the two main reasons why uh, some natal males uh, transition uh, to a female identity uh, and get sex change surgery and so on. Uh, <clears throat> for people who won't have come across this before, um, Blanchard's typology, right? Yeah. The the idea of there being two key motivating forces. Could you explain a little bit? Uh, yeah, absolutely. What? So um, there are two main pathways by which a natal male may uh, transition to a female identity. Uh, we used to call this I still call it transsexualism. Uh, you know, people are so fussy about language and uh, it's to the detriment of clear uh, understanding. Uh, so transsexuals are people who uh, want to be the other sex or become uh, some facsimile of the other sex. And um, among NATO males, there's two pathways there. The most familiar probably uh, is uh, child onset uh, gender identity issues in which a little boy, very young, uh, wants to be a girl, uh, is very overtly feminine, uh, likes to play only with girls, cross dresses, and so on. And most of... Uh, uh, those little boys, uh, at least until fairly recently, 
would grow out of it for reasons that people don't understand well. Uh, but a subset of them uh, would not grow out of it and they would uh, get sex changes. And that uh, type, uh, the uh, originator of this uh, typology is a guy named Ray Blanchard, who is a very important and distinguished uh, sex researcher, uh, who's also a good friend of mine. Uh, he refers to that type as homosexual, male to female transsexuals. They're homosexual with respect to their birth sex. It's a bit so, confusing, isn't it? So yeah. yes, it, there's no way not to be confusing when you're talking about <laughs> Is this the territory? people who change sex and, and so on. Yeah. Uh, so uh, they're homosexual with respect to their birth sex. They are born male. They're attracted to men. So they're homosexual in that respect. The other type uh, uh, he called non-homosexual male to female transsexuals, and they're non-homosexual because they're everybody else. Mm -hmm. uh, and some of them uh, would say they are sexually attracted to women, heterosexual with respect to their natal sex. Some would say they're bisexual. They like men and women. Some would say they're asexual. They don't like anybody. But uh, Blanchard, uh, Blanchard's research and his insight showed that all three of those uh, were motivated by autogynephilia, uh, which if you think about autogynephilia in the following way, autogynephilia is an inversion of an external sexual attraction. So these are men attracted to women, but, but for some poorly understood reason, they have this inversion of the female object inside themselves. They are attracted to the woman that they create inside themselves. Mm -hmm. If that uh, uh, attraction is complete, then they are unable to be attracted to anybody on the outside, and, and they will say they're asexual. They, they say, I'm not attracted to other people, but they're very sexually attracted to the woman they create inside themselves. Bisexual transsexualism is best understood as um, sexual arousal by the fantasy of being um, of, of attracting men. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so if a, if a, tr if a transsexual, a male to female transsexual uh, is so attractive that even men find her alluring then some of these uh, uh, transsexuals find that very arousing. And they fantasize about having sex with men as women. And they also are attracted to women. They identify as bisexual. <laughs> uh, so that explains uh, the non-homosexual. But I, I think it's just easiest to call those three subtypes heterosexual, uh, bisexual and asexual, all autogynephilic transsexuals. Mm. And can autogynephilia be understood as a spectrum upon which those three groups will be found? Well, I guess it's a spectrum in uh, two senses. One is um, the particular focus of autogynephilic transsexuals varies somewhat. Some really focus on uh, what their bodies will look like and what their genitals will look like. Some focus on the interpersonal aspects of autogynephilia and how they will be uh, viewed by others. Some focus on uh, dressing, uh, being made up, as a as women, but they all have in common sexual arousal by um, uh, being aspects of a woman, mm -hmm. and 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 I think you know, in they share more than they uh, differ. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, but the other aspect, the the other way, they're a spectrum is that. 
they vary in their intensity. That is, natal males without agonophilia vary from, you know, yes, I I have this fantasy and occasionally I indulge in masturbation thinking about it too. I need to become a woman. I need to get this uh, surgery. And, mm-hmm. uh, uh, and intense so, distress if they're not able to do yes, so. Yes, yes, that's right. Mm. Yeah. So um, we're going to get on in a moment to why autogynophilia is so spectacularly controversial as a sure. subject of study. Yeah. Um, first, I just wanted to address that one of the key criticisms that, that um, some trans activists and, other, and others make of the concept of autogynophilia is to say that actually um, natal women also experience something like autogynophilia. What's your response to that particular criticism of the concept? Um, yes, I, I've um, heard th- that objection for years and doubted it. Uh, and just last year, uh, I, with my uh, longtime uh, collaborator and ex PhD student, Kevin Sue, published a very large study showing it is false. Uh, we recruited uh, natal males with autogynophilia as well as natal males without autogynophilia and natal females. So we have these three groups. Uh, and we had very large samples and we uh, showed that natal males with autogynophilia uh, measured using Ray Blanchard's uh poor autogynophilia, autogynophilia scale were much higher in their average scores compared with both of the other groups, that is natal males without autogynophilia and natal females who were very similar to each other. So Mm -hmm. that's just, that objection is just false. Uh, You know, you do get if if you speak really vaguely uh, to people who don't know anything about autogynophilia, then some women will say, well, yeah, I, I kind of uh, find it sexy when I dress up and think about, you know, what I'm wearing and so on. And it, it is true. Uh, there are some really interesting fundamental differences between male and female uh, sexuality that uh, we may or may not get into later, but autogynophilia is not one of them. Mm. Mm. And um, am I right in saying that most men who, do we say suffer from autogynophilia? I mean, it's clearly can be a very burdensome thing to experience. Yeah. People who, men who experience autogynophilia. Um, experience is better. That, yeah. So this suffer the men who the, who suffer, they are suffering from autogynophilic gender dysphoria. And mm-hmm. not all men with autogynophilia develop gender dysphoria. Interesting. So some men would just sort of happily cross-dress in their spare time and it would never cause them acute distress at any point. I, uh, I wouldn't say never because it's mm-hmm. going to be, uh, you know... <laughs> It's going to be a little hard when they're in self-discovery mode because you know it's it's a weird thing that most uh, uh, teenage boys, for example, are unlikely to understand right away, and also uh, you know later on uh, to the extent that they uh, have uh, partners like uh, girlfriends and wives, uh, that's often going to cause some distress but they're not going to suffer in the sense of uh extreme dysphoria where they um hate their current selves for not being female so men who experience autocatophilia a largish proportion of them is the impression i get would really they don't identify in that way they feel very uncomfortable about being described as such and in general are quite resistant to the whole concept of autogynophilia. Is that fair to say that that's a, even a majority? 
of men who so experience it, it? So it, it's, it's very hard to know uh, what the attitudes of uh, most uh, autogynophilic persons is because it's hard to recruit a representative sample and survey them. But mm -hmm. uh, there is certainly a subset of them that hate the idea. And uh, I think that there are two reasons why they hate the idea. Uh, first, they consider it to be uh, bad uh, public relations uh, because they think people will be more tolerant of them as transgender if they think, if they believe the, the same old story that they're women trapped in men's bodies and so they had to change, then if they believe that they have this unusual sexual interest, a paraphilia, uh, that is uh, satisfied by changing uh, their bodies. Um, the other reason is deeper uh, and maybe more important even, and it is that um, people with uh, autogynophilic gender dysphoria, they have this deep need to think of themselves as like women. And the theory of autogynophilia says that they're not like women. They are men or males with this unusual usual paraphilia, which is really only found in men. Uh, the uh, trans transsexual uh, uh, writer and uh, uh, sex researcher, Anne Lawrence, who is a brilliant researcher of autogynophilia, entitled her book, Men Trapped in Men's Bodies. And that, that's what autogynophilia is. Mm, mm. and therefore shining a light on it yes as you've done in your work has not always been um welcome and could you tell us a bit <laughs> about the response that you had to the man who would be queen when it was published Maiden Mother Matriarch is brought to you by Keeper, the world's most advanced matchmaking solution. Now, many of you will know that I'm normally extremely suspicious of dating apps like Tinder and Bumble, which tend to produce repeat customers who must endure endless, miserable hookups and short-term relationships without ever finding a spouse. Well, Keeper is a completely different kind of service. Its algorithm prioritises immediate attraction, but also, crucially, long-term compatibility, because forever is the goal. Everyone in the Keeper matchmaking pool is there because they want to find a spouse. Using psychometric tests like Big Five, IQ and Masculine Feminine Polarity, Keeper can accurately predict who you're going to have the strongest chemistry with. The platform only gives you a match if you are an exact fit psychometrically and if the match offers everything that you've told Keeper you're looking for in a partner. It won't waste your time with only good enough matches like other dating apps and matchmaking services will. So find your Keeper at Keeper.ai. That's K-E-E-P-E-R dot A-I. When I when my book was published, uh, it set off a firestorm because um, three uh, prominent transsexuals tried to ruin my life because of it. Uh, they were, in order of importance, uh, Lynn Conway, who is a computer science at that time, a computer science professor at the University of Michigan, very uh, distinguished uh, scholar. Uh, Andrea James, who um, is a, I, I don't know, she would, would I don't know what, what she would have called herself. She was into PR 
and lived in Hollywood. And uh, she is, uh, we have a, a phrase in American, in America called a piece of work. I don't know if that translates. <laughs> I'm familiar with the idiom, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. A, a creep. Uh, and then uh, Deirdre McCloskey is another distinguished academic trans woman, uh, an economist, very, very well known and very highly thought of uh, in some circles, uh, even for being uh, heterodox, uh, but certainly not in that respect. Uh, they uh, all um, filed numerous uh, uh, charges uh, or tried to file numerous complaints and charges at my university, including my uh, ethics review board, which was taken very seriously and caused me a lot of uh, trouble. Uh, I don't know, uh, the... the state licensing board here and you know i'm not a licensed psychologist never presented myself as such uh anyway they they, they tried uh and i for a while succeeded in ruining my uh reputation and 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 really making my life unpleasant for several years they uh, tried to cancel you in other words they well were yes i i would i i I would say I was canceled uh, for a while. Uh, mm -hmm. And <clears throat> I did have the good fortune uh, because a um, a scholar uh, who at that time uh, worked at my university, but I didn't know, uh, named Alice Drager, uh, became aware of what was happening. She was initially skeptical. She thought that I was probably a bad guy. Uh, we met through a mutual friend and uh, we talked some. She b believed that maybe I wasn't obviously a terrible person and she did some investigation and decided to do a thorough history of this controversy, including interviewing uh, as many of the principals as would talk to her. And uh, she wrote a very thorough uh, uh, scholarly article uh, published in the Archives of Sexual Behavior that uh, cleared me of the uh, worst charges, although she still, you know, Alice and I are, are friends, but, you know, she doesn't always agree with everything <laughs> uh, that I say and do, and and that was clear in the article but then she uh wrote a book called galileo's middle finger that became a very successful book on um uh people who are uh persecuted in academia uh and intellectual world because of uh their ideas uh mm -hmm. and that was uh, you know the th that experience of being um of having my side of the story and frankly the truth out was just uh very cleansing and mm. satisfying and uh i you know hope whoever has sufficient interest will read uh drager's book or the article or both mm. it's a great book and it was how i first came across your work was via alice drager's work so as i'm sure it's true for many people um, so this is at the time, uh, 20 odd years ago, when trans activism is, is nowhere really on the political agenda. It's a very obscure topic. Yeah. And I presume basically no one has heard of autogynophilia, which probably still is mostly the case. Although I'd say that it's become better known as a result of all the controversies in, in, in recent years. Do you think that's, is that fair to say, yeah. do you think? Uh, it is absolutely, be, it's become much better known. Uh, and I think largely because of the controversy regarding my book. I, I do want to say one other thing. Uh, this is not, uh, people should not think of this as a war between some researchers like me and trans women. In fact, 
there are many, I would say it could be the majority of uh, autogynophilic trans persons who are delighted that autogynophilia has come to light. I got so many emails from people thanking me uh, for writing the book, sometimes saying, I finally understand myself. Uh, and uh, of course, there's been continued pressure on these people not to speak up uh, if they there are corners of the trans community. There's not just one community. There are certain trans persons who go out of their way to try to hurt anybody who uh, speaks well of the theory of autogynophilia. But that's, you know, on Twitter, I have many uh, autogynophilic followers and we have very uh, congenial conversations. They're very interested in the science of autogynophilia. And I've been uh, uh, very enthusiastic with continuing to study autogynophilia. Yes, I mean, I having read your work, um, I, I really don't think there is a shred of actual transphobia in there at all. And actually, the thing that really strikes me when reading um, reading you or Ray Blanchard or Anne Lawrence or Deborah So or any of these other sexologists who've touched on this subject is a real genuine tolerance and open-mindedness, um, which I suppose must be very common among sexologists because you're unlikely to be drawn to that kind of discipline if you have a, a low disgust threshold, <laughs> I would guess. Um, yes, absolutely. Yeah. So there really isn't any um, hatred yeah. to be seen. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I, I, I do, I am very, I'm very intolerant of, gosh, I don't know. Are, do, do we watch our language on this? podcast i wouldn't I'm, say so no. I'm, I'm very intolerant <laughs> of bullshit uh, and, and i'm intolerant uh especially of bullshit among academics who are supposed to know what they're doing and uh that uh frustration is what motivated me to write the book because you really one cannot understand transgender phenomena without knowing about autogynophilia and, you know, back when I uh, wrote the book, you know, in the world of sex research, transsexualism was, you know, a hot topic. It, not that transsexuals were common, but people were very interested in it. And yet um, very few sex, sex researchers knew about the concept and some of whom had heard of it just rejected it out of hand. Uh, and, you know, I met... The reason why I um, uh, embraced it so wholeheartedly was because I met an autogynophilic trans woman who told me her life story, which could only be understood <laughs> as through autogynophilia. This, this was a person who, um, as a man, enjoyed working on cars and and watching hockey games nothing feminine about that uh was a secretive cross dresser very intensely sexual would film herself uh, this pronouns are hard as a man so i guess i should say film himself back when he was a man uh wearing fake breasts a mask looking like a woman inverting his penis inside his body so that he could paste on a fake vulva and penetrate himself with a dildo in in the anus you you may have to censor this but do <laughs> go crazy but but anyway uh and that was extraordinarily erotic for this person and uh that person was uh you know very dysphoric in the sense of could not get enough 
uh, and saw a, uh, some kind of mental health worker who diagnosed uh, him at that time as transsexual and then obtained a sex change. And um, after the sex change, I met this person. And um, so this person was a very an extrovert and uh, an exhibitionist both and had filmed all of this stuff, I, uh, including the the <laughs> the sex act that I described before. Uh, and also, this person was very friendly with several members of the other type of transsexual, which I think very few people uh, have the uh, very few people get to see them side by side. And if you do, mm -hmm. they're so different. It's mm -hmm. really hard to uh, see them as the same. Plus, I the my informant, uh, the autogynophilic informant, was uh, extremely forthcoming, and most autogynophilic transsexuals are not at least haven't been and certainly the ones who attacked me all all three of whom and and their minions uh i think were uh are autogynophilic uh uh two of the three more or less have said so uh so um i i i think you know i was lucky uh, I, I was lucky to uh, have these experiences that really shed light on transsexualism that most people don't have. And so I try to convey that in my book. And I, I really think the contrast of both is useful. Now, um, the, the people who are currently in the public eye who might... Um, be well known uh i i so there there's this person uh well known in the u.s named jazz jennings do you know who that is yep uh jazz jennings is a ch child onset natal male who's uh transitioned to a female with numerous uh medical issues associated with transition but uh jazz jennings is certainly uh the homosexual male to female transsexual type and uh uh although she has never openly talked about this uh based on what i know about her which is that she was married to women and attracted to women and not feminine as a man, uh, that is enough for me to uh, confidently say that Caitlyn Jenner is the other type. And yeah. I would say actually most uh, trans activists, uh, male to female anyway, most natal male trans activists are, uh, as far as I can tell, autogynophilic transsexuals. Mm -hmm. Although... Probably most, so many famous trans people who are, say, models or actresses. I'm thinking of someone like Laverne Cox and a few other people. Laverne Cox is probably the homosexual type. Right, the super feminine yeah. from childhood type. Yes, and yeah. often that may partly be because it's often those um, trans people who pass both easily <clears throat> as the opposite sex. But yes, as you say, in terms of the activists, there seems to be an overrepresentation of of the autogynophilic type. Do we know what proportion of all um, natal mm. male trans people fall into each category or how, and has it changed over time? So whether somebody transitions and is that sense is transgender, uh, will vary over time. That is you take the same person uh, and a time machine, and you in 1980, 
uh, they have a certain uh, very low probability of transitioning. Whereas you bring them to 2020, it's much higher than it used to be. But they have the same underlying condition, be it um, very feminine homosexuality, which is the underlying condition for homosexual transsexualism, or autogynophilia, which is the underlying condition for autogynophilic transsexualism. So I would we don't know even what the rate of uh, feminine homosexuality is, which is probably the easiest to observe. <laughs> you know, I would say uh, it's less than, and, and I'm not talking just a little feminine. I think gay men in general tend to be more feminine than straight men, but I'm talking about very feminine. Uh, mm -hmm. And often physic physically petite and so on as well. So it's not just behavioral. I, I, I think that the, the physical, the, the petiteness uh, isn't part of the syndrome. I think the petiteness is what some of them uh, explicitly weigh in their decision on whether they should get a sex change. Because if oh, they're see. really big <laughs> and if they're not going to look good as a woman, they're not going to be as attractive to men. And that's one of the things that they care about. Interesting. Uh, so self-selection. In their their self-selection. Whereas I don't think autogynophilic males care as much about how they'll look. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, they're, they don't they're not trying as hard to attract other sexual partners. They're trying to please themselves. Mm -hmm. The, um, the, the, the homosexual type, um, we seem to see this kind of, um, phenomenon cropping up in a lot of different cultures, although often it's interpreted obviously differently depending on cultural context. So, um, the travesti in Brazil, uh, hijra in India, um, is it Fafavele? Is that right? Fafapina. That's the one. Yes. And, so this and is Samoa. Yeah. Yeah. So this is a thing that we observe um, across different cultures, which suggests that there's something innate going on. Whereas Absolutely. the autogynophilic type, I, I, I mean, my, I'm by no means an expert. My first degree was in anthropology, but then also what I was taught it, like, at university, obviously there was absolutely no mention of autogynophilia or, or such things. Um, but it doesn't seem as obvious that that's cropping up in other cultural contexts. Maybe what's going on is that obviously men weren't able to get surgeries and hormones and all the things that are now available, but also maybe they just chose to stay in the closet Um yeah, I, so I, yeah I, I think that uh, the underlying syndrome, uh, again, feminine homosexuality, which, by the way, is on the same continuum as just run-of-the-mill homosexuality. I don't think that uh, Bafafina and et cetera are fundamentally different from um, Western gay men. And, and my friend Paul Basie, who's a Western gay man who studies the Fafafina agrees. He he thinks there's nothing fundamentally different between the Fafafina and himself, uh, although some of them are more feminine than he is. He, he's not that feminine, but a, a, a little. Uh, uh, I mean, he likes uh, uh, musicals and so on. Uh, but anyway... Um, so feminine homosexuality and autogynophilia are the underlying syndromes. And uh, we don't know for sure what causes either of them. However, my gut feeling is, and some uh, evidence and just a priori considerations are that both are innate. They're both inborn. Mm -hmm. um, and they both seem to kind of 
come out of nowhere. Nobody teaches either of them to the young males who evidence them. Uh, the child onset, the, the uh, feminine homosexuality first emerges in early childhood. Often, as soon as the, these little boys are moving, mm -hmm. people are noticing they're moving like girls. Uh, so very before feminine puberty. You, yes. Well before puberty. And yep. Whereas autogonophilia uh, typically is evident first uh, during early puberty. Uh, and the most common uh, emergence is somehow uh, these autogonophilic uh, teenagers uh, realize that's really arousing to them to put on um, their their sisters or mothers' uh, lingerie, look at themselves in the mirror and masturbate, which is by far the most common uh first manifestation they don't learn that from anybody <laughs> you know uh and uh it's still yeah. very stigmatized even in the absolutely yeah absolutely even yes. now yeah and it yes so in that sense it's similar to other kinds of paraphilia which do tend to crop up at around puberty do we know why some I mean, it's overwhelmingly a male phenomenon, isn't it? Paraphilia. It's, it's rare to, to find them in women. Do we have any idea where they come from, what pos what pu what possible purpose they might serve in an evolutionary sense, or if they've they've got nothing to, they're not adaptive at all, or what do we think? Yeah, I I think um, they're not adaptive at all. Uh, I, I think that is uh, the best explanation of rare phenomena that don't seem to serve any <laughs> uh, purpose. And I would count both uh, paraphilias and for that matter, homosexuality as uh, evolutionarily not adaptive. And uh, I, I have <laughs> uh, many friends with either homosexuality or paraphilias and, uh, you know, uh, I, I love many of them, uh, and yeah, it's I not a moral judgment in difference. any way. Yeah, no, yeah, yeah. It's just, it's just it's a just scientific there, it fact. Doesn't... Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, there are theories out there around homosexuality maybe having some adaptive function, like uh, I don't know, having um, a gay uncle who might assist in raising um, his nieces and nephews could he could be spreading his genes in ways other than having children himself. Um, do you think though that it's it's more likely to be some other cause? Having spent because oh, I should say you spent much of your career studying um sexual orientation of all kinds, not just autogynophilia by any means. Yeah, no, I I the um uh, hypothesis that you're raising, uh the name of it is the kin selection hypothesis of uh it's usually associated with male homosexuality. That has provoked a lot of interest, and in and the, in the my friend Paul Vesey, who studies the Fafafina, one of the things he's focused uh, on in Samoa is the kin selection hypothesis, and he has found some evidence that the Fafafina uh, invest more in their nieces and nephews compared with uh, plain old uh, uh, non-transgender males. Uh, I believe his data. I don't think that the size of the effect is large enough to over to completely overcome uh, their their evolutionary disadvantage because he's also found, I believe, of the hundreds of Fafafina he's studied, I believe he's found only one who has reproduced at all. That's very striking. Yes. So that's a huge <laughs> evolutionary disadvantage. Mm -hmm. And and uh, male homosexuality especially uh, is an evolutionary puzzle. Uh, I think it's fascinating. And I uh, I don't think that we are close to solving it, but... Um, 
you know, Paul's uh, evidence for the kin selection hypothesis may be a piece of the puzzle, but I don't think it's the complete solution at all. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and in terms of paraphilias, I mean, so we might think we we might be convinced that autogynophilia is innate, but if you look at something a little bit more um, specific, like I don't know, an interest in rubber, that's not going to be something that someone in a culture that doesn't use rubber is ever going to come up with on their own. Do we think that maybe there's just some um, something else innate that latches on to particular objects? Are there particular triggers, or what's the, what does the science say about that at, at this stage? Yeah, yes. Um, the science doesn't say anything, but uh, your thought process is, I think, right on. <laughs> uh, you're uh, you you are thinking very clearly about it, and your thoughts uh, match mine. Uh, and there are a variety of phenomena that are clearly paraphilic. So another one. Um, so some men um, engage in a dangerous practice called autoerotic asphyxia, where they uh, uh, hang themselves with a rope and mass it's arousing to them. It's it's for them, it's this is uh, misunderstood by a lot of people. It's primarily a, a masochistic, masoch mm. masochistic, sorry. Uh uh practice there uh the unfortunately this men engaging this in this sometimes have a mishap and they die they might have a seizure they might not be able to get back on the stool uh and uh ray blanchard has studied the death scenes of these men and uh there are a couple of really interesting facts one is the they have a lot of masochistic pornography around them. And the other is that about a third of the time, they're cross-dressed, uh, suggesting there is an association between masochism and autogynophilia, which uh, there's other evidence for. There's nothing obviously similar between autogynophilia and masochism, and yet they're does seem to be this kind of close association. And uh, the hypothesis that I'm working with is similar to what you stated earlier. There's some underlying susceptibility, vulnerability uh, to paraphilias that uh, can be molded by experience. Uh, so I, I am aware of, uh, a uh, case of one man uh, who as a teenager learned that a, a student, a, a fellow student, a girl had committed suicide by hanging herself. He immediately felt an overwhelming desire to practice autoerotic asphyxia and became a practitioner now that experience was important to this person that is hearing about this suicide but how many people have that reaction yeah it's They're, a very strange and quite disturbing reaction yes yeah 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 so we don't know exactly why people would latch on to all sorts of strange things. Um, <clears throat> I should ask as well, I think that you in general take a more um, tolerant view of the porn industry than I do. Um, but would you say that there is some role to play given the enormous variety of porn that's now available to people and including at these formative ages where, where paraphilias might be developing? Do you think that modern porn might be... Um, inducing paraphilias in people who might otherwise not have had them? So um, it would be great to do a controlled 
a randomized controlled study on this mm. uh, to take, uh, um, I don't know, different cities and, and flood uh, some of them with weird porn and, and keep them out of other cities. And then maybe we could answer this question. Imagine getting that past an ethics yes, yes, right, right. <laughs> Yeah, but obviously we can't. So uh, my uh, strong intuition is that no, I don't think porn causes paraphilias in people. However, I do think um, the availability of porn, including unusual porn like uh, sissy porn, which by the way, I've, I've never seen, even though I study related phenomena and I'm not averse to uh, porn. I've just never <laughs> crossed paths with it. Uh, uh, I should say, Michael, you're the, I think, the seventh guest on Made Mother Made Shark and the third to mention Sissy Hypno porn. So yeah. I, don't know, I don't know what I'm doing, but somehow it keeps, came up, keeps coming up in conversation. <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> well, and so far as I understand it, I, I think it is something that many autogynophilic males would enjoy. Mm -hmm. uh, as I understand it, and it, it's uh, it involves people being made to dress up and act sissy, often by an attractive woman or something like that. If that's and that's that's a that's a clear autogynophilic fantasy, and and even before um, visual audio visual pornography, uh, that was a common. Uh, storyline and their their story libraries of uh and cross-dresser uh uh sites and that's that's a common so I, I i think two things happen one is that people with certain inclinations even if they're not exactly even if a, a male is not exactly sure what his inclination is they're certain they're seeking stuff and and yeah, it tells you something, it. doesn't it? If you're actually seeking this stuff out, because most people yeah. won't. Yeah, and and also, yeah, I mean, I suppose it's possible that somebody who came across something like that might come to recognize their paraphilia earlier than they otherwise would have. Uh, that's possible. Um. A thing I really want to ask you about, but I'm going to wait until we get into the extended part of the episode okay. about how this all plays into um, to uh, paedophilia and hebophilia, which I know you've also studied. Yeah, but I'm going to leave free subscribers on that cliffhanger. <laughs> okay, and wrap up for the 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 free the 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 standard episode. I'm gonna I'm gonna bring to an end now, and then I'll I'll we'll rejoin in a moment to do the um the bonus section for for subscribers. Could you tell people where they can find um, more of your work if they're interested <clears throat> in learning more? Yes. <clears throat> I am, uh, in some senses, a conventional academic in that I do not have a nice website. <laughs> uh, I have not started a Substack uh, <laughs> or a podcast, even though I consume Substack and podcasts <laughs> and, and look at nice websites. But so... Uh, the best place uh, to find my work uh, would be on the academic-ish sites, Google Scholar, and also ResearchGate. Uh, you can also email me directly if you would like. My uh, favorite email is profjmb, like Professor Prof J. M as in Michael, B as in Bailey at gmail.com. And uh, if you're, I love talking uh, to people who are interested in ideas and my research. Um, and anybody wants to complain, uh, I should provide a, a different email address. Please uh, email uh, Andrea James. <laughs> uh, with any complaints about me um, <laughs> certainly yeah. don't email me anyone <laughs> yeah right. yeah michael thank you so much it's been a pleasure <laughs>
Thank you so much for watching that episode of Maiden Mother Matriarch and for all of your support. It means an enormous amount for the growth of the show. If you want to hear bonus content, an extra 20, 30 minutes of conversation with the guest, maybe a little bit more personal, a little bit less filtered, then you can go to my substack at louiseperry.substack.com where you can sign up for extended episodes and also bonus episodes and you can also access our chat community. You can also support the show by subscribing on YouTube or subscribing wherever you get your podcasts and rating and reviewing on Apple Podcasts is also really great for encouraging other people to give the show a try. Please also spread the word, tell people that you know who you think might like it to give it, to give it a shot. Um, the word of mouth effect is really valuable, so we'd really appreciate it. Thank you so much, everyone, for listening, watching and supporting what we're doing. <laughs>